Thank you. <laughs> All right. So here we are on Tisha B'Av. As um, y'all know, I'm Bextern Rosenblatt. I'm going to put my email in the chat right now so that y'all can find me afterwards. Um, and we're talking today about a very weird topic, we're talking about anger, um, specifically anger at God. And on Tisha B'Av, like the, the default is that we're commemorating, we're, we're marking, we're remembering, we're reliving tragedy. We're reliving the destruction of the first temple. We're reliving the destruction of the second temple. Um, we're th thinking about the, the exile from Spain. We're thinking about the worst things that have ever happened to us. But now for this one hour, we're gonna be thinking about anger rather than thinking about tragedy. And so what I wanna start out with is inviting you all to share in the chat and in this class, you're just going to be typing in the chat or emailing me. You're not going to be raising your hands. Um, but just in the chat, times that you've been angry at God, moments of, of anger at God that you've experienced. Um, Y'all here, presumably, because this is a topic that means something to you. So anger at God, when are you angry at God? When has anger at God happened for you? Is that something real in your life? Is that something you're curious about? What causes you to be angry at God? Um, <laughs> and I'll give you all a minute. Um, times you have been been angry at God. All right. So far, we've got we've got illness and death. Wow. Oh, Jonathan Pollock, anytime I read the news. Um, all right. Lots of illness, lots of death. Um, lots of things where it's like, this is unfair. This is, this is against the way the world is supposed to work. Or this is something that I have no control over. Holocaust, human suffering, environmental destruction. Um, or things in the life of my children when I don't when I don't have power to change. Angry at God. Um, ooh, great. Um, <laughs> Michelle, I haven't, but maybe I need to be. Yefe, okay. Um, so we've got a lot of a lot of death. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of the first Jewish texts that we have that features this anger, that 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 embraces this anger. And y'all are gonna see that the reason we're angry is largely the reason many of you are angry. Um, it's lack of control. It's uh it's illness, it's death, it's bad things happening to good people. It's, ooh, a line angry that the destruction never seems to end. Awesome. Okay. So the Jewish text we're going to start with is actually not, I'm going to talk about it for a minute. It's not yet the source sheet. Um, the Jewish text that we're going to talk about is the Book of Lamentations. And the Book of Lamentations takes place when the very worst has happened. Um, our country has been invaded, our city has been laid siege to, our neighbors, our families have been slaughtered. We've starved so badly that we've lost what it means to be human. And the only respite came for us when we finally lost totally and our way of life was destroyed, we were taken from our homeland and sent into our exile. That is, those of those of us who were left, those of us who survived. We'd, we'd watched our sons, our daughters killed. We'd watched our parents killed. We'd watched people we love and people we didn't love die. Um, 
And what happened to this invincible city that was our home was totally destroyed. It was burnt to a crisp. What happened to God, our God, this God who supposedly created the heavens and the earth, our God who chose us, the people of Israel, to live in the land of Israel? Well, it's uncertain. God's home had been destroyed too. The temple has been reduced to rubble. And that raises all sorts of deep existential questions. What's, what's life now? Who am I now? Do, do we exist as a people? We've lost the land. Does that mean we've also lost the nation? We've lost the temple. Does that mean we've also lost God? So the covenantal blessings and curses that appear in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, as well as some of the prophetic texts, provide a very simple answer to these questions. They say, yes, we still exist, and yes, God still exists. We have done wrong, we violated God's commandments, and we defiled the land, and therefore, don't worry, uh, the land vomits us out, ejecting Israel from the land of Israel until the land resets, and we are ready to, as, as they say, use our big kid manners at the table. Once we've been appropriately punished, once we've been reduced to a remnant, we'll learn our lesson and come back into the land. Now, like that's that's the normative voice of the Hebrew Bible. That's the that's Leviticus and Deuteronomy. That's the the happily ever after almost of of the way the world works in the biblical view. And that's what the book of Lamentations is going to be angry against. That's what the book of Lamentations is going to push back against. So uh <laughs> We're going to start looking just at briefly at Deuteronomy 28, where we see the co those covenantal curses appear. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go through a lot of text in this class in the next hour or so. I'm going to be reading the text in the English. You have the Hebrew there as well. I might refer to the Hebrew from time to time. A note on the translations that you'll see, they are all my translations and translations are tricky. There's always something lost when you do a translation. Um, every translation is a result of interpretive choices. Mine is no different. Um, I do do my very best to be faithful to the nuances of the Hebrew. And I do that sometimes at the expense of sounding good in English. So. The English text you'll read is very close to the Hebrew text, and it's a little chunky. Doesn't sound pretty. You want pretty, go read Robert Alter. Um, okay, so here we are in the covenantal curses and blessings. We're at the very end of the Torah, looking at the idea of covenant, looking at the idea of, of what it means to be in relationship with God. We read, and if it will be, and it will be that if you truly listen to the voice of God, your God, keeping and doing the commandments, which I am commanding you today, then God, your God on high, will place you over all the nations of the earth, and all the blessings will come upon you and will overtake you if you listen to the voice of God, your God. And it shall be if you do not listen to the voice of God, your God, keeping and doing all his commandments and his laws that I am commanding you today, then all these curses will come upon you and they will overtake you. All right, it's about to get really dark. And you shall eat the fruit of your belly, the flesh of your sons and your daughters that God, your God, gave to you during the siege and during the stress that your enemy will stress upon you. The tender and very refined man amongst you shall look evilly at his brother and at the wife of his bosom and the, at the remnant of his children that remain, refraining from giving to one of them the flesh of his sons, which he eats without leaving for him anything during the siege and during the stress that your enemy will stress upon you. 
the tender and very refined woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the earth out of refinement and tenderness, she will look evilly at the husband of her bosom and her son and her daughter and the afterbirth that comes out from between her legs and the daughters to whom she gave birth, she will eat them in secret, lacking everything during the siege and during the stress that, the in that your enemy will stress upon you. If you do not keep and do all the words of this teaching written in this scroll to fear this respected and awesome name, God, your God. Okay, hard text to read, but this is back in Deuteronomy. This is, this is the covenant we agree to. This is the relationship we establish with God is if we do well, if we do right, if we follow the covenant, we get all this good stuff. And if we do not follow the, the covenant, we get all this really, really horrible stuff, including parents eating their own kids described incredibly, incredibly graphically. Um, my one and a half year old is sitting downstairs. Um, this text has hit me a lot differently since I've had this one and a half year old. Like this is, this is horrible. This is imagining the very, very worst. Um, <laughs> Eva writes in the chat, I assume eat is supposed to be, met be metaphorical. This is you know, consuming your future. This is destroying destroying your your hair comb, just destroying what comes after you. And that would be nice. That would be that would be better if we just read it metaphorically. We'll see in the book of Lamentations that this is not going to be metaphorical. This is going to be real. So I want to take a moment and give you time to respond to this text. Um this is this is the covenant we get into. This is our relationship with God. This is the one of the defining texts of our relationship with God. And I only gave you the worst of the worst of the covenant. I didn't give you all the pretty blessings that came in the middle of this. Um wh what do you what do you make of this? What does it mean to be in a covenant like this? What does it mean to be in a relationship with God when this is our relationship? Um Susan points out that the idea of eating your children is something that has happened historically. She talks about the, the Donner Party. It's also something that we see in sieges throughout history up through the 20th century, um, siege of Leningrad. Um, <coughs> ooh, Lana, this sounds like an abusive relationship. Interesting. Okay, so this sounds... This sounds like, like we're in a relationship with someone who is who is gonna abuse their power against us, going to do worse to us. Um, <coughs> I God is God the destroyer. Ooh, okay. Um, Vel asks a question on God, the pronouns I'm choosing to use for God here. Um, briefly, throughout this class, I'm going to refer to God as he that does not reflect my personal theology, that doesn't reflect who God always is in the Hebrew Bible. But often in the Hebrew Bible, God is portrayed as a husband and Israel is portrayed as a wife to God. In the text that we happen to be reading today, that's the case. So I'll refer to God as he and Israel, personified Israel as she. Um, <laughs> Okay. Uh, so we've got the, well, we can take God out of the picture. Maybe God's not forcing us to do this. Maybe this is just if, like, if we create a society in which where bad stuff happens, then bad stuff will happen. Um, and uh, we've also got this idea that maybe, um, Maybe God is just kind of evil. God is abusive. God is too much. It, are you, like, does this text make you angry? Does this text elicit emotion? Oh, Ellie's saying, yeah, my daughter had this, 
had this text for her for her bar, bat mitzvah, and it was so upsetting she decided not to believe in God. Um, <clears throat> okay, great. So Sandy's saying this the emotion this elicits is despair. And that that's great. That's something we're going to be thinking a lot about today is here we on Tisha B'Av, this, 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 um, this, um, not holiday, this day of mourning, um, this day of despair. And we're looking at the angry side. Um, so this is definitely, definitely when you have a text like this, when you have the unimaginable happening, one response is despair, is loss of hope, is there is no way to go on, there's nothing, there's no way to proceed, there's I'm going to throw up my hands and give up. And another way to proceed is, is anger, is saying this is wrong, I'm going to protest, I'm going to scream, I'm going to shout, um, I'm going to, I'm going to cry out. And when we cry out, there's a question of like, okay, what's that doing? To whom are we crying out? What are we hoping to accomplish with our crying out? So we're going to keep going and look at that difference between, between crying, between despair, between tears, and crying out, anger, shouting out, hoping for change. Okay. Yefe. So <laughs> I... We just looked at the covenantal curses, um, and in some ways, this this take on the destruction and exile is brilliant because it returns agency to us. Right? It's not that we were crushed by the Babylonians. It's not that we we were weaker and a stronger army came and destroyed us, and now there's nothing left. Rather. Uh, it's that we are at fault for everything that happened. We had been given a covenant and we broke it and therefore we got destroyed. However, as y'all have been saying, it returns agency to us only to the degree that we believe a husband has the right to beat his out of line wife, only the, to the degree that the covenant we made with God places no limits on the destruction which God can bring upon us so long as a remnant survives. And we leave the telling of our story here. We leave the telling of, of what happens to Israel, to Jerusalem in the mouths of the prophets here in Moses's mouth. And then you'll see, you see in later texts in Hosea, in uh, Jeremiah, I. Uh, in the mouth of these, these male prophets talking about us, putting words in our mouths, blaming us and having us accept the blame, saying, yes, we did wrong. So this is where the Book of Lamentations come in, comes in. And it provides a radically different response to the problem of total destruction. Situation is the same situation. The worst has happened. But Jerusalem is now given her own voice to speak. And Jerusalem is angry. As biblical scholar Carlene Mambelfo titled her wonderful book on the subjects, on the subject, uh, Lamentations, the Book of Lamentations gives daughter Zion the chance to talk back to these prophets. Today, we're going to be following Batzion, Daughter Zion, personified Jerusalem's voice through the Book of Lamentations. We're going to be seeing her anger. We're going to be pushing back against the idea that this is all her fault and that everything that has happened to us has happened for good, that we've been punished for, uh, that our punishment is serving both education and purifying purposes. Now, the Book of Lamentation starts, it opens with a voice that sounds an awful like, awful lot like a normative prophetic take. Jewish tradition ascribes that voice to Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But as the book goes on, describing the destruction and guilt of the personified Batzion, the personified daughter of Zion or Lady Jerusalem, Jerusalem decides she's had enough. She's gonna pick herself up and push back 
and she's going to push back with real anger and that's going to change the way the book works that's going to change the way the the normative voice talks this voice that's perhaps Jeremiah talks and you'll see that the tone of the whole book shifts we become angry no matter how much we try and tell ourselves this is all good. This is right. This is written in Deuteronomy. This is written in Leviticus. This is what our relationship is. That's not going to win out in the book of Lamentations. Um, okay. So <clears throat> just a few notes before we get started with the rest of the sources. Um, we're going to be performing one way of reading the book of Lamentations. There are a infinite numbers of ways of reading this text. Uh, there's a reason Perkea vote says of the Torah, turn it and turn it again for all is in it. This is just one way of turning it. Let yourself turn with it, especially if this isn't your normal way of reading it, especially if you're not inclined to be angry at God, try it out, explore something new. Um, in order to do this reading, you'll see in the source sheet that uh, my source sheet distinguishes among the voices, among the, the normative voice and the voice of, of daughter Jerusalem through the use of italization. You will also note that the original Hebrew text of the Megillah does not in fact come with italicization to distinguish different voices. That is all to say, I'm choosing to read this text in a particular way. Um, you'll see why I do that as we go along. It's this idea of reading the text as if it contains multiple voices in dialogue with each other is all the rage in biblical studies right now. And it is in the tradition of Michal Bakhtin. If you're interested in more about Michal Bakhtin, he, I'm a little bit obsessed with him happy to talk to you by email about him or send me a, send me an email. Um, also, speaking of emails, if you're interested in bringing a full course or a lecture or a curriculum on lamentations or other biblical topics to your synagogue or to your Hillel or whatever your learning community is, email me. I work for the Fuchsburg Jerusalem Center. I'd be glad to come. We'd be glad to send someone. We'd be glad to make that happen. Um, okay, so back to the text. The question posed by the Book of Lamentations is, is Echa. Now, that's normally translated as how or alas. It's this guttural cry that is wrenched from the soul. You hear that in it, right? It's Echa. It's, it's, it's like if you... I know you're all on mute, but just take a minute and say that. Like, echa. Feel that, feel that travel up your body and out. Like, it's, it's echa. It's coming out of you. It's this, oh, I love that. Yeah, it's this, it's this incredible, incredible, your soul expelled through your mouth. This, this, I have, I'm giving everything I can. How could this happen? Alas, how could this happen? This is too much. How is this possible? What Echa does, what this word does, what the pronunciation of this word, word does is, is despair and anger all at the same time, right? It's, it's the, my way of understanding the world is broken. Something is not right. Something is broken and I don't understand and all I can do is expel my breath, is expel my very soul through my mouth, is echa, is lament, is, is project air. So we're going to look quickly at um, one of the times that <laughs> this, this word, this word is used in, in the second book of Samuel, chapter one, by David when he's lamenting over the loss of Jonathan and Saul. And Jonathan, this is this is sort of outside our topic, but it's this idea of lament. It's what what causes you to say echa? 
what causes you to have anger and despair? And here in the text we're about to read, 2 Samuel 1, um, you'll see that David's just lost somebody who loved him. And his response is Echa. Uh, you'll note this is a phrase you are all super familiar with. Um, I'll read it, 2 Samuel 1. And David lamented this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, his son. How have the mighty, or how have the mighty fallen in the midst of wall, in the midst of war? Jonathan, in your high places slain, troubled am I over you, my brother, Jonathan. You were very lovely to me. Your love for me was wondrous, more than the love of women. How have the mighty fallen and the weapons of war been lost? Okay. So it's Jonathan's just lost somebody who loved him dearly. Sorry, David's just lost someone who's loved him dearly. And he's asking how. He's asking echa, or ech in this case, but echa, how is this possible? This is the cry that gets wrenched from him in the moment of individual loss. Just as many of you said above, when am I angry with God? Why am I angry with God? When death happens, when unexpected death happens, when something that, when something seems wrong with the world. And here David's saying, how could someone I love be dead? And what's more, how is it possible that someone who's a gibor, someone who was a hero, someone who was in the prime of their life, how could they now be dead? This is not right. This is not, this is, this doesn't compute. I can't make sense of this. All I can do is say, eh. all I can do is shout out. Um, the way you're familiar with this is um, how the mighty have fallen, right? That's a phrase y'all have heard before. Yeah. Um, and the, the force of it really is, how is it possible to the mighty have fallen? How is it possible that this could be? I'm I'm angry that this has happened, or I'm despairing that this has happened. Yefe. Okay. So we're gonna take that idea of echa, take that way of reading this word into Lamentations. The book of Lamentations is five chapters long. Most of those chapters start with the word echa, start with this cry, this guttural, desperate, how is this possible cry? Um so. The very first chapter of Lamentations uh, has these two voices, the normative voice that we consider Jeremiah and Jewish tradi tradition in dialogue with Lady Jerusalem herself. And um, you'll see that it sounds a lot like Deuteronomy. It sounds totally like, yes, this is my fault. Yes, I've been abused, but it's my fault I've been abused. And it's kind of unpleasant. I'm gonna read a selection of it right now. And the question I've got for you is, is there anger in this text? Is there anger already in Lamentations 1? And is there a difference between the way that the normative voice, the voice of Jeremiah is talking and the, vo and the way the voice of Jerusalem is talking? Do they perceive the events differently? All right, so Lamentations 1. Echa, alas, how can the city sit alone? Once great with people, she has become like a widow. Once great among nations, princess among provinces, she has become a slave. She weeps and weeps at night, her tears upon her cheeks. There is no one to comfort her among all her lovers. All her friends betrayed her. They have become her enemies. Jerusalem has sinned and sinned, and for this she has become derided. All those who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She too sighs and returns backwards. And now Jerusalem speaking in her own voice. Is it nothing to you all, all who pass this way? Behold and see, is there pain like my pain 
that was dealt out to me with which God has made me suffer on the day of the wrath of his anger. From on high, he sent fire into my bones and it dominated them. He spread a net at my feet and he returned me backwards. He gave me desolateness all day. I am faint. The yoke of transgressions was bound by his hand. They were woven together and raised up on my neck. He made my strength fail. My Lord gave me into the hands. I am not able to get up. Righteous is God, for against his mouth I rebelled. All peoples, please hear and see my pain. My maidens and my young men have gone into captivity. Okay. So question, is there anger in this text? Who's expressing the anger? Is there a difference between the way that Jerusalem's responding and the way, which is the italicized, the second voice, and the way that the first voice is responding? They're describing the same events. How do you, how do you understand them? Um, Sarah's, experience, Sarah's seeing the profound grief of Jerusalem. Okay, Yefe. So we've got grief, disappointment. Awesome. There's Yefe. Okay, lots and lots. This is this is sadness. This is this is this is despair. Um, Yefe. Okay, Emily's points out Jerusalem wants to be heard. Jerusalem wants somebody to hear her. She keeps saying, like, look and see, look and hear, pay attention, somebody notice me. But that perhaps it's still from a point of, of despair. It's still from a point of grief. Um, and Lauren points out she's lonely, right? And that is exactly what the speaker note said at first, right? That is the defining, defining thing that the speaker said at first is how could the city sit alone? How is it possible that <coughs> the city sits alone? That this Jerusalem was surrounded, Jerusalem has, love, has lovers and been loved and is full of people and now she is alone and she's despairing. And what she's looking for at this point in the text is somebody, is anybody, is a way out of her loneliness. Awesome, okay. And when we look at the blame between the first voice and the second voice, who's who's blamed? Who's who's at fault here? Lee points out she's blaming herself, right? So in verse 18, we have Sadiq hu Hashem ki pihu meliti. Righteous is God, for against his mouth I rebelled. So there it's like, my fault. I rebelled. I brought this on myself, very much in line with Deuteronomy 28. Likewise, thank you, Raya. Oh, nice to see you, Raya. Um, in the first voice, um, in verse 8, we have Chet Chata Yoshalayim. Jerusalem sinned. Jerusalem sinned a lot, and it's her fault that the blame is against Jerusalem in both of the first voice and the voice of Jerusalem herself to an extent. However, we're also blaming God a little bit in Jerusalem's voice, right? Bell points this out. Um, <coughs> and Yankel points this out as well. God did this, right? God's the one who made me suffer. God sent fire into the bones. God spread a net. Spread a net. God gave me up into these hands. God made my strength fail. God did this all to me. And if it doesn't seem angry yet, it does seem like there's a little bit of blame. It's somebody, Jerusalem's shouting, right? Jerusalem's crying out. She's saying, look at me, see me. I am suffering. I am suffering because God has done this to me. And God did it to me, but said it. God did it to me righteously. But God still did this to me. 
Now, this, the first voice, the voice of Jeremiah, hears this and responds to it when we get to the second book of the second chapter of Lamentations. So this is Lamentations 2, describing basically the same events, um, but describing them very, very differently. So once again, we're going to, I'm going to read first um, the voice of the prophetic voice and then the voice of Jerusalem. And you'll see that it sounds different. Um, the question is, is there anger here? Against whom is the anger directed? And what is it supposed to accomplish? Okay, so Lamentations 2. Alas, how can the Lord cover Batsion, daughter Zion, in a cloud of anger? He sent from the heavens to earth the splendor of Israel, and he did not remember his footstool on the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up and not had pity for all the pastures of Jacob. He has overthrown in his overflowing the fortified cities of daughter Judah. He has brought to the earth. He has defiled the kingdom and her princes. He has hewn down in fierce anger all the horn of Israel. He has returned back his right hand from before the enemy. He has blazed against Jacob like a flaming fire, consuming all around. He has bent his bow like an enemy, standing his right hand like an adversary, and he has killed all the precious things of the eye. In the tent of Dodger Tzion, he poured out like fire his rage. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces. He wiped out his fortified cities and he made great in daughter Judah, moaning and lamenting. That's the first voice. Second voice responds and says, See God and behold to whom you have done this. Should women eat fruit, the little ones of their cuddling? Should priest and prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? They are lying on the earth, on the streets, young and old. My maidens and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed on the day of your anger. You have slaughtered and not had pity. You proclaimed like an appointed time terrors terrors all around and there was not on the day of the anger of god refugee or survivor those whom i cuddled and made great my enemy finished them okay it's a tough text to read um tell me about the first voice the the jeremiah the prophetic voice and tell me about the second voice are either of those voices angry? Who's to blame? What? Where's God in this text? Um, <clears throat> oh, Marianta, really interesting. So here, here it's okay. Well, God punished, and God was supposed to punish. We got that in the covenantal curses, but this is too much. This is the point at which this is too much. God, look and see, because like, if you're a God worth believing in, if you look and see moms eating their kids, there's no way that you could, you could stand for this. Like, maybe that's something you could have said back in Deuteronomy, but can you actually watch that and, 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 and live with that? Um, you say, Emily, the second voice, the should implies a failure of morality, that the second voice, perhaps there's anger, there's holding God to account, there's, there's, this is, this is wrong. Even if this is in the covenant, this is wrong. Um, Nikki, good to see you as well. Um, Nikki points out that the first voice is talking about God like an enemy, right? That we keep saying God has done this like an enemy, God has been to 
bent his bow like an enemy god has done this as it has become the lord has become like an enemy by the time jerusalem finishes talking in verse 22 she says those whom i cuddled and made great my enemy finished them that this is no longer talking about god as if god were an enemy this is this is straight up saying god you're the enemy which is is crazy right um is is i mean that's that's y'all are playing with with grief and despair here is jerusalem grieving is she despairing oh, sorry grief and anger is she grieving and despairing or is she angry is she pushing back and here it seems like by the time that she's saying god god you are the enemy this is too much that's that's anger and yankel thank you anger is part of the grief right it is part of the it is part of the like echa the the world has been destroyed and now what now what do we do um and and jerusalem's anger she says god you're the enemy god you did this god this is too much um <laughs> and and this should not have happened um Yefe. Okay. So these voices continue to be in dialogue with each other. When we reach Lamentations 3, we have this wonderful passage I didn't give you. It's I am the man who has seen a affliction under the rod of his wrath. Um, and this prophetic voice, this Jeremiah voice, all of a sudden is identifying with Jerusalem, saying, Yeah. I have, I too have suffered. I too am angry at God. But then Jeremiah tries to walk it back. Then the prophetic voice tries to walk it back and really, and we're going to see this in a sec, really, really tries to say, you know what? No, it's my fault. I can't be angry. Anger isn't useful. I've got to take responsibility. It's all about me and my responsibility. And if I'm just responsible for my actions, if I just do what's right, it's all good. I can make it better. There's no reason to blame God says the prophetic voice, and then that doesn't quite work. So we're going to read, or I'm going to read now a section from Lamentations 3. Uh, who is this that has spoken, and it has come to be? The Lord did not command it. From the mouth of the Most High, it did not come out, the evils and the good. And then this is this is one of the most quoted lines in all of Lamentations. Of what should a living person complain? A man about his sins? Like, what are what are you complaining about? What are you angry about? It's your fault. You sinned, right? Okay, in that case, how should we act? Let us search our ways and examine them so that we may return to God. Let us bear our hearts in our palms to God in the heavens. And we try that, right? We're doing all of this, you know, chuva stuff. And it doesn't work. We have transgressed and rebelled. We've done wrong. But you, God, have not pardoned. You have covered with your anger and pursued us. You killed and showed no pity. You have covered yourself with a cloud so that prayer could not pass through an outcast and a worthless one. You have placed us among the nations. All right. So, <coughs> right. Um, we tried, like we really tried to say, I don't need to be angry. Anger isn't a useful emotion. I don't need to blame someone else. The only thing I can control is myself. And so long as I do right, so long as I, as I try to, to, uh, you know, go for a run every day and not eat too much sugar, then everything's going to be okay. And it doesn't work. We say, so long as I pray, so long as I do chuba, so long as I turn back to God, then God will turn back to me. That because I turned away from God, God turned away from me. I can turn back to God. God will turn back to me. And we all live happily ever after. And it doesn't work. And God does not turn back to us. In fact, God 
pushes us away. God covers up our prayer. God doesn't let our prayer through. And it's, it's this moment where, I mean, how often have, or has it happened to you that you've been grieving, that you've been angry, that you've been in this place of, of too much of despair, of, of hopelessness almost. And someone's come along and said like, no, it's okay. Like, it's fine. Like, it'll get better. Just, uh, just do X, Y, and Z and it'll be fine. And you try and it doesn't work. And we've got that happening here. And when you try to turn back to God and God doesn't turn back to you, when you try and reach out to God and God is pushing you away, wow, I mean, that's, that's cause for deep despair or deep anger. So moving on to Lamentations 4, um, still in this voice of Jerusalem, we have Jerusalem saying, okay, I've got, I've got anger. I'm angry at God and I'm going to, I'm going to try and, and use that anger for good. I'm going to try and direct that anger towards something useful. When I direct my anger at God, nothing happens. I'm, I'm throwing my anger at God. I'm raging against God. And God hasn't responded to me. And that's one of the features of the Book of Lamentations is the whole time God does not respond to us. So instead... Lamentations 4, I'll read now. This is us, this is Jerusalem talking about her, one of her enemies, uh, the nation of Edom. Rejoice and be glad, daughter of Edom, dwelling in the land of Uz. Also to you will pass the cup. You will get drunk and make yourself naked. Your inequity will be brought to the end, daughter of Z Zion. He will not content, continue to uncover and exile you. He will take note of your inequities, daughter of Edom. He will uncover your sins. Okay, so this, this incredible anger we have that's been building against God, that we've been shouting against God and God hasn't responded, that God isn't letting our prayers through, we turn instead against the other nations. In, we turn instead and say, okay, God, instead of being angry at me, like, God, if you're angry, don't be angry at me, be angry at somebody else. Go, go crush the other nations who've done this to me. And so we're still pushing that anger out into the world, but at another nation. Um, I'm going to just take a minute to look at the questions here. Um, <clears throat> uh, Okay, so why why does God not respond? Why is God not responding to us? That's the that's the existential question at the heart of this all, right? Why is God not responding to us when we're crying out when we need God? That usually in the Tanakh, at least, we cry out and God responds. That once we've suffered enough, the way our covenant works is we suffer, we cry out, God responds. And it doesn't happen with the Book of Lamentations, really. That once Jerusalem is destroyed, God is, God is lacking. And we'll see in a minute, we'll see that this is the beginning of, of a separation from God, of a, of a reaching out for God and a looking at the world in which God is not directly intervening anymore in which bad things happen and we can't say, um, excuse me, God, I need a miracle right now. Can you fix it? And God's like, all right, coming right up. What a miracle and one large fries. Um, and we gotta, we gotta contend with that. Um, Yefe. Okay. Um, all right. The very last quote I'm going to bring you from the book of Lamentations is the way the book ends. And this is painful. This is horrible. This is the last cry that Jerusalem utters for God to, to look at her, to behold her, to understand her. You all who have listened to this yesterday, uh, read in synagogue, will know that when we when we chant this, um, we don't end with the final verse. Instead of ending with verse 22, we read verse 21 again. However, the way that the text works, the way that it's written in the Book of Lamentations, 
does end with verse 22. All right, Lamentations 5. You, God, will forever sit on your throne from generation to generation. Why for perpetuity will you forget us? Forsake us for the length of days. Hashivenu Hashem Alecha Venashuva. Return us, God, to you so that we can return. Renew our days like days of old. Ki im maos maastanu ktsafta alenu ad meod. Unless you have utterly rejected us, you have fumed over us fairly. Okay. So we end with this saying, God, like you're, I know you're still there. Like, even when you're hiding behind the curtain, I know you're still there. I know that you exist forever. And just like you exist forever, let us exist forever. Let the nation of Israel exist forever in relationship to you. Um, and <clears throat> the only way we can come back to you is if you allow us, if you open up those gates of prayer, if you allow, if you uncover the cloud of, over you and allow our prayer to come through because that's not happening otherwise unless you return us to you we cannot return to you and then verse 22 so painful right unless you have utterly rejected us the very last line we say to god you have fumed over us verily okay so the question i have for you is we're the way in Lament the book of Lamentations ends is with us pointing out God's anger at us. And when we think about our anger at God, what role does God God's anger at us play in that? To what degree are we angry at God because God is angry at us? Does Is God putting anger out in the world? Is God teaching us to be angry? And if God is teaching us to be angry, why? I mean, we're created, according to the Hebrew Bible, right? We're created B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God. And the Tselem Elohim that we have is an angry God, is an odd God that is fuming over us, that is angry, angry, angry. So what are we supposed to learn from that? What does it mean to, to for God to be angry at us and our response to be angry at God. What does it mean to have these two, two entities in this like furious anger at each other? Ooh, Aaron, really cool. Um, the one of the things anger allows us to do is be in relationship. That God's angry at us and we're angry at God, but at least we're still in relationship with each other. That anger allows, allows uh hope in some way right it's not that god's gone it's that we can be angry at god because we expect better from god and that god can be angry at us because god expects better at us that um ooh, rabbi weintraub interesting god has modeled abandonment but we're seeking a mutual return and god like god maybe has modeled abandonment but the way we're reading it is God forever will sit on your throne from generation to generation. God, you're still there. Even if you're, even if we feel abandoned, we're saying, God, you're still there. It's just that you're still angry. Um, <clears throat> Yefe. Okay. Um, that there's something here where by like putting human emotions onto God, we're allowing for our own emotions. By putting anger onto God, we're saying we should be angry that anger serves a purpose. Um, okay. We've got one final source that I'm going to read. This is from the Midrash on the Book of Lamentations called Echaraba that was written about 800 years after the Book of Lamentations was likely written. Um, this is written after not just the first temple has been destroyed, but the second temple has now been destroyed. And this idea of destruction that seemed like it was a one-time horrible event now is something that it happens. 
something that just happens to us, right? It's not that, oh my God, how could this happen? It's like, no, this has happened again. It's always happening. We're always being destroyed. The way we define our relationship to God, the relationship to the land of Israel is by exile and return and exile and return and continual loss. And <laughs> Lamentations Rabbah says, okay, so how do we deal with that? And specifically this bit I'm about to read for you is commenting on a verse that we read in the in the third chapter of Lamentations. The verse was, you have clothed yourself in anger and pursued us, you being God, you killed and showed no pity. So we've got rabbi, these rabbis making sense of this in the Midrash. Rabbi Chelbo asked Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman, he said to him, I have heard that you are a master of stories. So what is the meaning of that verse? You have covered yourself with a cloud so that prayer could not pass through. And Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman replies, prayer can be compared to a mikvah and repentance to a sea, just as a mikvah is sometimes open and sometimes locked. So too are the gates of prayer sometimes locked and sometimes open but the sea is always open. Thus too are the gates of repentance always open. So here we have the pro problematic verse, God's making it so we can't even pray to God. If we can't pray to God, then like all we can do is be angry. Like there's no way back. And Rabbi Nachman says, actually, no, it's okay. Prayer can be closed. Tshuva, repentance, is always open. Now, just for a minute, difference there between prayer and repentance. Prayer to God and tshuva. Where, where is anger in both of those? Do you pray when you're angry? Do you do tshuva when you're angry? How do you understand the relationship between prayer, tshuva, and anger? I keep asking you guys these big questions and then you have to type these responses and we get these awkward pauses, but it's fine. Um, look forward to reading your responses. We're almost out of time. So I'm just going to talk at you for a minute. Um, there's definitely something where tshuva is, is a step that happens after anger. You can pray when you're angry. You can cry out to God when you're angry. You can't perform tshuva necessarily when you're angry. Tshuva is action. Tshuva isn't, you know, throwing your, your book against the wall. Tshuva is going and acting in the world. Um, and so I think there's, there's a, a progression that can be made here when we look at anger in the Jewish tradition and say, yes, there is a place for anger. We see anger when we can't get to God, when bad stuff has happened, when we are crying out for God's attention and God's not answering. When we see injustice in the world, when the echa moments happened, when the stuff we don't understand has happened, when we can't make sense of death, when we can't make sense of illness, when we can't make sense of injustice, that's when we need anger. That's when we need to cry out. That's when we need to say, God, pay attention. Someone pay attention. And we can rage. We can say all of this. And if that doesn't work, if those, if those prayers, if those moments of crying out to God don't work, eventually, according to the Midrash, there's a point at which we're going to say, okay, the, the gates of prayer are closed right now. And I've got to turn inward. I've got to do tshuva. The only thing I can do is, is having let out my rage, having, having let God know, having, having screamed and shouted, I can now act. Um, okay. Y'all, thank you so much for learning this with me. Um, I hope you have a meaningful rest of your fast, if you're fasting, and a meaningful rest of your Tisha B'Av. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat one more time. If you have thoughts that I didn't get to hear, please share them with me. Um, and I also, I 
teach a lot of different classes. If you want to get on my email list, uh, please send me an email. I teach a regular Parsha Tashavua class on Fridays and Thursdays, um, which you can sign up for in the link I just shared. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Wishing you a meaningful rest of your day.